Hi, I'm Catherine. And I'm Sheila. And we're taking you through private eyes. In this episode, you will hear Jeff being interviewed by investigator Kathy Kaysen of Cass County Sheriff's Department. She interviews Jeff the night of the incident at approximately 4.30 in the morning. Yeah, we were on a four-wheeler ride. Everything was fucking good, you know, and uh, Natalie walked up. And like her and her husband were out there and I turned my back to Danny to talk to Natalie and she got mad. And we were, you know, it's like, you know, thought you would walk over here, you were playing on your phone. And she uh, went to the other end and talked to CJ and Jamie and, you know, uh, messed around, you know, talking and stuff and, you know, intoxicated because she started stumbling and kind of falling. I was like, oh, it's time to go home. I got gone side by side and down to Jamie's, and uh, we argued on it going back that way. I didn't have to get the ramps out, drove it up on there, uh, killed it off with her. You know, and I buckled the seat all the way back so she could lay back, and I was strapping my fuller, and it, it said, Ow. I was like, What the hell was that? You know, which there's people out there, you know, there's people on the hook, and there was. Like CJ was leaving, called him on the phone, talking, you know, got in the truck, I was talking to him, and it was kind of almost like smoky. I was like, what the fuck is this? You know, I told CJ, I was like, can Danny just shot herself? He's like, I gotta get, you know, get to the house and get them there. I guess I lost my four wheeler somewhere and called 911. I got Morris County, and uh, then I got Cass County, and um, then they trench from your EMS and I talked to the lady. I mean, I guess previous to that, the way I realized is I looked down and my pistol was sitting there and she was just kind of laid back. I thought she was passed out to that point because I don't keep her around in the chamber, you know? So I got one several months ago when she got paroled and, uh, and I was like, what the hell? I couldn't tell the right side of her head, you know? I ended up talking to the Sartain, is that his name? Mm -hmm. He showed up first and I told him what was going on and I tried to have that towel there on me, but I mean, just there because I felt her skull platelets move, you know, whenever I got her out of the truck. <sighs> All the rest of y'all showed up. Her dad owns an auto parts store in town, and she was, Mason was with me, and they were talking one day, and he lives right down the road, and she's like, I can do it. So, you know, I, and then what kind of cleans my house in April, her and Billy, with it got real serious, and he lives in Amarillo, and she started going out there. So, you know, it started out, she was watching Mason and cleaning every other week. And she was you come up with every excuse why not this could work and all this, things like that. And I kind of gave in and we started dating. It was real leery about like the age different. I was like, okay, I'll try it. So everything had been fine up until tonight? No, we, and things have been kind of rocky and we had fought forth and argued, but nothing super bad or whatnot. I mean, almost killed my child. And I'll be damned if that shit comes around my house. Okay. Did she drink regularly or just uh, like an occasional drinker? No, nah, they're just, you know, like any other like 20 or 21 year old, you know, they'll be at their place and whatnot and go out and do it. So did she, but she consume quite a bit tonight? Yeah. She had like a six pack of some kind of Jack and Cokes or Jim and Coke little bottles. Mm -hmm. And she had some kind of jello shots that she and I think she drank a little wine bottle thing some kind of uh oh, I don't remember what it's called Moscato okay. pack of it she drank some of it but her thing is is she doesn't know how to do it in moderation and when to back off you know she's drink 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 as I started out I was gonna go see her and I was like Jamie and I were having a full ride you want to go on and she's like yeah yeah so she was concerned of you talking to Natalie's what started this tonight. Yeah, but she went in with some stuff about fucking cared and bothered me. She started in with that. She's like, you turned your back on me and da 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 and so talked to her to ask her something, you know, you know right. pissed her off. 
so there was a number of people there, but you didn't know all of them. No, not really. You know, uh, Chris and Natalie and Jamie and CJ. And there's a couple others that were there that I knew. I don't know the okay. rest of the people. And on Wednesday, her stepmom, Kayra, was in Longview getting her hair done with her nephew, and she went and had lunch with them. And then Wednesday night, I went to her dad's house and ate dinner and come to mine afterwards. But at no time, several months, she's never made any kind of outcry of her harming herself. This was a... Did she... What was she saying when she was trying to take her seatbelt off? So, uh, we just need to come over here. Do we just need to go get it out of the road? Yeah, it's in the road. We can't sit there and guard all night. And I didn't want to call a record. Come pick oh, it my, up. My cousin lives right down the road. I'll just flip it on and drive it to her house if that's okay. Yeah, it's fine. They're going to sit there somebody moves. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. No, she's never said anything about me. I mean, said like, Elena didn't want me. And I don't know why you want me. I guess when her mom and dad got divorced. She was, her mom would go months, six, seven, eight months at a time without calling her or being her. And her dad always told her shit like he was stuck with her and whatnot. And she, so, I mean, she had talked about stuff like that, but nothing about killing herself or anything. Okay. And you said um, her friend is Lisa. Do you know the last time they talked? Oh, yeah, they talked today. Okay. They live together, they I'll see each other all the time. Okay, so that's her roommate in Longview. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So y'all were loading up, and that's when you heard the, what you thought was a firecracker. Yeah. Off. I didn't see a flash. No, I had my back to the truck, and everything was trapping the four-wheeler down into the boom. And I was, what the hell was that? Because it was this part next to a middle shop, and it, like, echoed off of it. And I was looked around. What the hell is that? I just thought it was some of the people out there playing around. Okay. I think that's all I'm going to need for now. Angie's List is now Angie, your home for everything home. With Angie, you could cross your next project off your to-do list before this ad is over. Just tell us what you need, and we'll handle the rest. Sending a top pro to get it done. Or browse reviews, compare quotes from pros, and connect instantly. All for free. For everything from routine maintenance to a dream remodel. Because however you want your project done, we'll get it done. Download the app or go to Angie.com. That's A-N-G-I dot com to get started. What kind of relationship did they have? I think that should have been looked into. The other thing is where the firecracker, if you want to call it, happened. Was it Jamie Cook's? Was it? At his house, when he was opening up the door, even though his keys are still in the ignition of his truck. I have a hard time with the gunshot at Jamie's house because there were 30 other people there and no one heard a thing. The couples that they did interview said they heard nothing. They were there when Jeff and Danny got back from their ride, but they did not hear a gunshot. In his interview with Kathy, Jeff says that he called CJ before he realized that Danny had shot herself. So I'm confused. Why did he call CJ if he was just with him? And CJ says that when he called, he said, Danny shot herself. She killed herself. It doesn't check. So CJ's story is conflicting with Jeff's story in that moment. But Jeff's story also conflicts with his own story at the crime scene it makes you wonder what their relationship was. But on a basic human level, wouldn't you be just performing some sort of, or having some sort of reaction, whether it be the comforting part, at the very least, someone's in pain and agony, wouldn't you do something? Even if they're a stranger. Exactly. I don't know if he ever saw any kind of action, but if he was in a war situation... This situation should not have thrown him where he he couldn't function. Just a motor memory of what to do. Well, whether you see combat or not, you're still trained in first aid and first responding. So that is true. Yeah, you learn that in basic training. That's true. Well, and I still have an issue with 
the loss of the four-wheeler. Going back to my point about what he says to Kathy in the interview where he called CJ first and then realized that puts him in the car already driving. And what action does it take to lose a four-wheeler, to flip a, a hitch, a trailer? So what happened at that moment that, that you lost the entire you know, trailer on your, on your truck? So it's like there's three potential places in my head that it could have happened. And I'm with Danielle. It doesn't make sense for it to have happened at Jamie's for a number of different reasons. Well, we still have over two hours unaccounted for. According to certain paperwork we have from the attorney, it says that the ride ended around 10 o'clock. The 911 call wasn't until 1241. Then there is a narrative that they went to someone else's house to drink. So what happened in that two and a half hours? Why was CJ following him in the first place? He lives in the complete opposite direction that Jeff does. But let's kind of talk about who they interviewed. One of the couples, the husband said he was intoxicated, but it doesn't sound like they asked the wife who was the designated driver. Why would you not interview the wife? The four photos that we have of Jeff from the crime scene include one that focuses on his T-shirt and the top half of his jeans. There is one of his head and to the chest area. There's one of just the underside of his hands, just his palms. No pictures show the top of his hands. And then we have one of just his waist down to his boots. And on those pictures, the only one that shows any kind of blood at all are? Are his palms. It's dried blood. I don't know enough about how quickly blood drives dries versus other substances, but it seems like if there's little of it, it could be dried within minutes, right? So it d- kind of depends on how much, how much there is. I think the lack of blood on him also is important. He took her out of the car and laid her next to his truck. The seat is reclined back as we do see it in photos. And has he, as he has stated in some narratives, other narratives, the seat was up. That's a whole nother subject. But if he's dragging her out of the truck, that's going to take some maneuvering out of the front seat to get her out. It's going to be blood transfer. Well, and that's just it, right? So think about it. If you're removing a, a limp person from a truck, and you care about them, you're just trying to make sure that you are, are you cradling them in a way that you're kind of hugging them against your body to remove them from the truck? Are you grabbing her hands and just yanking her out? I mean, how, how is there no blood on your, on your person and just your hands if you are carefully removing her to begin with? And we already know that he is refusing to render aid. So he's not, you know, doing compressions or, you know, cradling her in any way if there's no blood. So I think that's a good point too. And where did the towel come from that he had on her head? Jeff tells Roy Barker, the way I realized it is I looked down and my pistol was sitting there and I picked it up and it, and I was like, there was a round in the chamber. So Jeff is saying he doesn't keep a round in the chamber. Is that correct? That is correct. He said he keeps it in the console of his truck, but he does not keep around in the chamber. Let's talk about the gun. What did he do with the gun when he said he noticed it? Jeff says, I picked it up, saw it, and like threw it down. He doesn't say he turned around and saw it. If Danny is reclined in the back seat, she's technically behind him. But he says it as if it's right there next to him, not behind him. And we all know the gun landed in the front seat, on the floor. No, the only way we do know that is there's a picture of it laying on the front front floor of the passenger side. So we actually don't know where the gun was. That's a question I think Officer Sartain or Roy Barker should have asked. So a good follow-up question for Jeff would be to ask him how he knew there was a round in the chamber. When he's driving, Jeff says he picked the gun up and realized there was a round in the chamber and he threw the gun down. The only way to tell if there was a round in the chamber of an SAXD without pulling the slide back would be to see or feel the small indicator at the top of the slide. It actually goes to a raised position if the gun is live. 
this is a feature Jeff would need to be aware of because it is so subtle. I doubt that he stored the gun with the slide back or if he's driving, even used two hands to pull the slide back just enough to see if there's a chambered round without ejecting it. So let's walk through that. You're driving along. Remember, he gets in the car. It's kind of smoky. Remember that part of the story. He has to turn on his, turns on his defroster. When does he check the gun? As he's driving along, it's dark in the car, is it not? And he's driving erratically so much that the ATV falls off. So let's go through it. Dark, there's smoke in the cab. You're driving erratically and you check the gun. Anybody think that's suspicious? Not the detectives. I do think that somebody should have followed up with that. You know, you're in Texas and I got to say this, you should know your guns. And as soon as he said that, somebody should have said something. That's kind of the whole thing. My confusion about the whole thing, I shouldn't be this confused about the series of events. He's driving, he picks up the gun. You don't pick up a gun with one hand and know anything about a gun. Like you have to have two hands. Is your hand on the wheel? You know, the darkness of it all, the smell of the gunpowder, none of it makes sense. Agreed. Three separate interviews. Do you feel like they shared notes or they compared notes at all? That's the big question for me. It doesn't seem like they do. And if they did, they swept something under the rug because there are glaring issues. Whether the investigators or the detectives spoke or not, there isn't enough detail in the individual interviews for it to make sense as an interviewer. And they focused only on Danny, never on Jeff. Right. There are so many issues that I, I, I just don't understand. It feels like this explanation of him picking up the gun, it doesn't make a lot of sense to me. It doesn't seem like the logical progression of how things would have happened. It also doesn't fit in one of the narratives he's said, um, even two of the narratives, I think. But the first thing that I thought of when I was thinking about the gun and his description of of the firecracker and then getting into the vehicle and the smoke hole scenario is he, no one asked him if he had smelled anything either. Um, and, you know, that's that's frustrating because everyone knows what gunpowder smells like, I think, for the most part. And then the other thing that I think he explains later in the interview is about when he purchased the gun. And I'm not sure that that was ever verified either, to be accurate. And that was the other thing about the gun that I kind of would have followed up on. Well, and that and that's kind of the point here. I'm I'm not only thinking about what Jeff is saying and his inconsistencies and his stories, but I'm also thinking about what the detectives didn't ask in the interview. And that's, of course, easier for me to say now, having reviewed the whole information and or all the information in its entirety is to be critical in hindsight. But it doesn't seem... My experience with police interviews is that they go in a bit more skeptical and are asking questions about the individual they're, they're interviewing as opposed to more about Danny and trying, it sounds to me like Kathy's trying to verify the suicide as opposed to call out some of the, or press him on any of the discrepancies in his personal statement. Homicide 101 or crime investigation 101, you are supposed to go in considering it's a homicide until you can prove otherwise. That is across the board. Rookie cops know it. What it seems to me in this case, they did the opposite. They were moving towards suicide and verifying suicide in Danny. Nothing about Jeff and Jeff's story or what happened to those two, two and a half hours. Nobody seemed to ask him about that missing time. Where was he? What did he do? Who was he with? Those are really basic questions. There's no follow up on any of his responses. She moves on to the next question. And it goes back to kind of Danny. And the thing too, is that she's asking him questions about Danny that are hearsay. They're not even, 
They're not even facts about the night. They're not facts about the event. They're not, you know, challenging him on the discrepancies. They were questioning Danny and Danny's motives to killing herself and not what was Jeff doing? What's Jeff's background? Did Jeff ever threaten her? They asked if she self-harmed, but did they ask, did you ever threaten your girlfriend? Right. The interview focuses more on corroborating suicide than it does flushing out inconsistencies in his story or asking follow-up questions. The next progression of the interview, like flushing out the details of what he's saying in every response. And yes, it's always easier to go back and look. However, if you're a trained professional, that is your profession to learn how to interview witnesses and flesh out whether or not they're telling the truth. She should have gone back and had him repeat certain things. Kaysen's doing the interview and in walks an officer. And Danielle, what does the officer do? Well, I don't even hear him knock on the door. He just walks in and it the interview abruptly stops. And he is asking Jeff what he wants to do with the ATV that is still at the crash site. Jeff says, you know, I'll call someone that lives nearby. But this whole disregard of the interview that Detective Kaysen is trying to do with Jeff just hours after the accident happened It's like it wasn't even important. He just walks in, interrupts. They start talking about something else, which totally disrupts the flow of the questions and the interview process. And it's kind of like, well, where was I? It, it, It just, to me, it spoke that that interview was not important. It wasn't done in an investigative fashion, it was more obtaining the facts. And I just thought that was completely disrespectful. When you are doing an interview, you don't want distractions to your witness. Your witness needs to tell the story and then you need to go back and ask questions to it. Once that happened, that interview really was over. Yeah, completely. This just shows that they did not take anything going on seriously. Interviews are really important in investigation. It's important for the witness to go on the record. Yeah, I mean, this was the interview done just hours after the incident. It wasn't his second or third time interviewing. This was fresh in his mind. It just happened. And yet here already that interview is being interrupted by another officer. Well, and it's a small town and it's a small county. Just putting Jeff's name in the system, I'm surprised his prior interaction with the law didn't come up. Did they not even look into his past at all? But remember, we've talked about this, all three of us. There seems to be a connection with Cass County. That's another thing too. Did y'all realize that he he starts by saying that he got Cass County. He doesn't say he asked for Cass County. He said he got Cass County. And that bothers me because it's just not how it happened. And like you said, everything that has happened in this investigation still begs the question, who does he know in Cass County? The story from CJ is that Jeff called him to follow him through town. CJ's home is the opposite of going through town. Why would Jeff have CJ follow him through town? What's really interesting about that, initially we were under the impression that CJ was following. When CJ did the interview with Barker, that's when we had to stop and rewind and stop and rewind the tape. CJ was in the lead and Jeff tore past him. And that's when the ATV was going cattywonked on the highway. 
Yeah, why does Jeff need CJ to follow him in the first place? CJ was so heavily intoxicated, he said he had to have somebody else drive his truck home that evening. And he lives in a completely opposite direction than Jeff. It is not on his way home to follow Jeff into town. However, we also now know that ATV riding ended at about 10 o'clock. The 911 call was at 1241. We have two and a half hours that are unaccounted for. Neither Jeff nor CJ were asked why CJ was following him home. It doesn't make sense. And there's no question there. There's no question mark. And if CJ had someone driving him, why wasn't she interviewed? Right. So to add more confusion to that night, Danielle, talk about the narrative to Officer Rachel. CJ told Deputy Rachel that he and Jeff were down the road at a friend's house drinking some beers and talking. CJ stated that Jeff called him, told him to follow him into town, but CJ was drunk, so he had someone else drive them, and they started out following Jeff. This event sounds like a completely different event than the ATV ride. So this is just another stop that happened after the ATV ride, but before the ATV crash. So this is another event that happens within that two and a half hour time frame between them leaving Jamie's house and the 911 call. Nobody has any follow-up records of it. No one asked in any of the interviews anything about it. Whose house were you at? Where were you? How far was it? That's very questionable. Who's this mystery person that drove CJ's truck? We have in the body cam, we see this person on video. Were they never talked to? Why would CJ and Jeff not be very forthcoming, cooperate, tell the police everything? What makes me want to look at a case like this is the inconsistencies, Jeff and CJ. And then, of course, the follow up from the police. This is definitely a case that I believe needs another look through from local authorities. Yeah, it's not only the inconsistencies, it's the unfinished. They start something and they just don't finish it. There were supposedly up to 30 people riding that night, yet we only know of the two couples that were interviewed besides CJ and Jeff. What about everybody else? How was Danny and Jeff acting that night of the ATV ride? How do other couples perceive their relationship or even their friendship? To that point, that's where the investigation begins. But then you go, you do your first wave of interviews, and then you circle back to the main characters again with the information that you've collected. And so not only was everyone interviewed, but there was no follow-up with anyone after even putting all of the information together. So the reason that we're pointing out the inconsistencies is to bring you through a case so you can look at it yourself. Look at it from the standpoint, is he telling the truth? When you're looking at a case, you should look for inconsistencies. Do the inconsistencies add up to the result of that night? The story is Danny Smith shot herself with all the inconsistencies of Jeff and CJ. Does that night end with Danny shooting herself? Yeah, and you add in the 911 call, the interviews, the statements, and then you have the physical evidence. And does all of that back up Jeff's story that Danny shot herself? In my opinion, from what we have seen, it doesn't. You brought up a very good point. You said the forensics. We don't have good forensics because the police did gunpowder residue on Jeff, but they chose, made a decision not to send it to the lab. Why would you not do that? First of all, it's your job as a police officer. That's a very basic forensic test. The forensics that they took are subpar. I can go down a different path in this case. Jeff and Danny are having a terrible night. She's upset with him. He's upset with her. They're fighting and arguing. Jeff already admitted that. They get into the car. 
Jeff's gun is in the console. What if Jeff pulled it out and placed it on the console and said, do it, just do it. If you're so miserable, do it. Or could have been taken a little further. The people telling the story are always the ones that have the most to lose because the other person that could tell the other side is dead. You've got Deputy Chief Roy Barker, who gave the narrative that the stories basically are the same throughout, and we can prove they are not. We've got the documents and the video. Yeah, Roy Barker interviewed Jeff with his attorney three days later and brought in a Texas Ranger to attend the interview. And after briefing him on the case, Roy puts in this statement, it was not recorded, but it was basically the same interview he gave investigator Kaysen the night of the incident. Well, basically the same isn't good enough when you're taking a police statement for somebody that died. Basically the same to one person could be extremely different to another person, especially a private eye. 